Hello, everybody. Um, my name's uh, my name's Neil Gampa. I'm here with Joseph Basic. Say, say hello, Joseph. Uh, and Dusty. Uh, we're here to talk to you about an, ButterFS, and you know, here we go. So, a little bit about all of us. Um, I'm a contributor and package maintainer. Um, I work in various systems management projects, and professionally, I'm a DevOps engineer at Datto. Um, you can reach me by Twitter, and my email's on there. Uh, Joseph? Yeah, I'm a, one of the core ButterFS developers. I've been working on ButterFS since it was uh, released to the public, so 14 years now, a really long time. Uh, I currently am a software engineer at Facebook, uh, and um, yeah, that's about it. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Dusty. Uh, I'm a big Fedora contributor, at least I like to think I am. Uh, I'm involved in uh, Fedora Cloud and Fedora Core OS groups, and I'm um, employed by Red Hat to work on, uh, you know, Red Hat Core OS and Open Shifty things. Um, you can find me on Twitter or email or IRC or uh, many different places that Dusty Mabe has um, posted up his name. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Um, all right, so for the starting point, um, I'm going to hand this over to Joseph to, you know, talk about ButterFS and introduce it to the to the wider world. So, cool. Uh, so, what is ButterFS? ButterFS is uh, new. We say new, but it's <laughs> relatively old, actually. It's a copy on write file system for uh, for Linux, and that's kind of the idea behind it. Is bringing some of the more advanced uh, modern features to a Linux file system. Uh, those features being snapshotting, um, send and receive, RAID support, uh, checksumming, compression, encryption, all these kind of like built-in things you kind of would expect a file system to do. This That was kind of the goal of ButterFS. You want to do the next slide? Uh, I didn't not change. No, there it goes. <laughs> it's just a yeah. little laggy. Okay. There we go. Uh, so what was copy on right? Uh, so this is kind of how we maintain data integrity. And by that, I mean, like whenever you crash the box, it comes back and you want to be able to still have your file system in a, you know, a stable, mountable situation. Uh, the way ButterFS does this is every time you modify the file system, it allocates a new block and copies the the old data into it and you modify it and you write out the uh, the new data. It gets a completely new set. So there's always a um, a consistent view of the file system on disk at any time. Previous, uh, one of the more uh, popular versions of data consistency is journaling. So that's what ext3 and 4 and XFS do, which is essentially you write metadata to this one section of the disk. So you write it to there and then you write it to the original place and then you say, okay, once it's written to the original place, you tell the journal you don't need that block anymore. Um, and, and so it's it's kind of, it's overwrite basically. So you write to the journal and that's the new place. But every time you modify the metadata, you write over the old location. And um, the, one of the benefits that copy and write gives us is really, really cheap snapshots because we can just create new trees every time we modify things. It makes it really easy to snapshot. So you get snapshots for essentially free. Basically, every snapshot operation is the same, no matter how big the file system is. You just copy the root, update reference counts for all the children, and go. So it makes it like really cheap and easy uh, to create and to keep track of. Um, that because of that, it's really relatively easy to move back and forth in time. Uh, and because of this, we can because of the sharing, it means that we can do things like send and receive really easily and really cheaply instead of having to like walk through the entire file system and say like compare m times and that sort of thing like what rsync does we can actually like in the metadata go down and say okay these blocks aren't shared copy the unshared blocks and it's a lot more efficient um that being said this is copy and write is not some like magical thing that just like makes everything wonderful it's just a new or not new, but like a different way of maintaining data consistency. And so there's, you know, trade-offs for everything with file systems. And 
we get really nice, cheap, efficient uh, snapshots and that sort of thing, but it still doesn't protect you really from bad hardware and that sort of thing. So it's not really one of those, th uh, these sort of data integrity things that we have in, but inside ButterFS, it's not an excuse for you to just ignore good data um, maintenance, which is to say backups, you should still you know, be backing up your stuff. You, you still have the single point of failure over your disk, right? And there's only so much a file system is ever gonna be able to do to protect you from bad hardware. Uh, so how big can ButterFS get? It's a, you know, it's kind of standard, boring 64-bit file system. XFS is like this. Most modern file systems like are like this. Uh, we'll support up to a max file volume size of 16 exabytes. Um, yeah, it's a lot of data, but <laughs> hopefully you don't ever really have a file system this big because it results in other interesting problems. Um, but yeah, we're, it's... It, like I said, it's a modern file system. Most file systems kind of do this. The only exception really is um, ext4, and that's just because the way they had to iterate on ext3, they have like 48-bit for their addressable size because that's as much space as they had in the super block at the time. I want to Ooh. say that I could be yeah. wrong about that. Yeah, they did a they did a recently a recently I say it's been like three years now. They did a uh, um, an on disk format change to switch to sixty four bit um, super block, and that was a backwards incompatible change. Right. But, so, yeah. and even before, I mean, forty eight bits like you're still talking a ridiculously huge <laughs> volume. Like, yeah, maybe it'll uh, be a problem in thirty or forty years. So it's not a problem now. I can say from personal experience, you probably don't want to approach even a quarter of this size on a single file system because because bad things tend to happen when you get that big. Like, I, I don't care what file system you're using. Bad things happen when you get that big. Yeah, it's a matter of testing and that sort of thing. Like we, uh, So WhatsApp um, has recently started using ButterFS for their backing store for offline messages. And uh, they fill up they raid together two relatively large, or no, they raid together four relatively large NVMe drives for a giant 16 terabyte file system. And they fill that thing up and it's exposed a lot of interesting corner cases. So like, you know, file system developers kind of, we test a lot of things, but um, stress testing is kind of where we lack. And so we can do these things, but your mileage may vary. So this is sort of a list of the features of ButterFS that Joseph has actually kind of just touched on briefly um, throughout the earlier slides. Um, no reason to really read off all of them, but the the 16 exabytes is is the maximum size. But the the most important thing here is that um, this is this demonstrates like all the different capabilities that it has uh, across the board for a variety of use cases, um, including the subvolumes and snapshots, which then I'll hand back to Joseph for talking a little bit more about that specifically. Right. So uh, every uh, every file system or every file system tree inside ButterFS is its own B tree. So that's what a subvolume is. Every subvolume is its own essentially inode namespace, everything. It's it's completely discrete B tree. And so subvolumes exist from a practical standpoint to be snapshot points, right? So for example, you would like make your home, you know, each individual user its own subvolume. So they could snap, snapshot individual subvolumes, or you could do home to snapshot entire like everybody's stuff, that sort of thing. It's it's kind of where you want to have discrete snapshot points is where you want to have subvolumes. Uh, the other use case is because they are their own B trees, sometimes for like application specific workloads, it's handy to have different subvolumes just to spread out tasks. Uh, kind of the example is this WhatsApp use case where they have, um, they kind of shard out messages based on user IDs. And so they have a different task managing a different 
part section of the shard, and each of these shards have their own sub volumes, and this cuts down on the amount of lock contention because the every time you have to like modify the B tree, you have to take locks down the B tree, and so s splitting up your sub volume like this is a nice way to spread across the load. Um, but how do your sub sub volumes interact with the file? Like, act just like a directory. The only kind of special thing is that users can't remove their own sub volumes or snapshots without a special mount option. Um, and they also, they look a little bit funky because inode numbers are unique to the sub volumes itself. So if you like, if you're kind of used to like inode numbers being unique across the file system, that doesn't really happen in ButterFS if you have, you know, a new sub volume, you create file foo, that's going to have uh, inode number of 257. If you create a new sub volume in that sub volume and create foo in that sub volume, it's going to have 257. It's, it's one of those weird, unique things. Um, uh, and then from a user, from like an rsync perspective, the thing that we did a long time ago is we make these sub volumes appear to be on a different device. And this was one of those things that was implemented to help our sync. So it knew the difference between a sub volume and would not walk into snapshots and like back up millions of the same thing. Um, but generally speaking, sub volumes kind of behave just like directories. Uh, how big are the snapshots? Uh, sorry, I'm looking at questions in here. Uh, how big are the snapshots are the same size as the data being snapshots? No. So it's because of the copy on write, if you create a snapshot, it's just an extra block. It's an extra root. So whatever your block size is, it's like 16K. And so as you go ahead, Neil. There was actually a question earlier that I realized I just missed. There's two of them. One was, what is the number of disks limited? Is that tested? And also there was another one about what does seeding from other file systems mean? Okay, so there is a disk limit because in the way ButterFS handles multiple disks is it has a mapping tree, basically, and that's how it bootstraps itself. Like boot, everything inside ButterFS just uses a logical byte number, and that's just zero to the length of the disk, right? Um, but then it has this mapping that says, okay, byte number one meg is actually on this disk at this real offset. Um, because of that, we have to have the actual disk mappings in the super block itself, and we have a limited size in our super block. So I think the limit's 128 disks. I want to say that's what it is. Uh, we, we had this weird case, like 2006, like within months of ButterFS coming out, where somebody took this weird Dell thing that had 256 disks and try to make a ButterFS file system using all of them, and it, it wouldn't let you. Um, I think we figured out the, the actual logical limit is 128 disks, and that's because of this mapping thing that you have to be able to bootstrap in order for us to be able to access the rest of the file system. Um, and then seed devices are like a special read-only device uh, that you can use. So you create the file system and you mark it as a seed device. And this is no longer uh, readable, it's, or no longer writable, sorry. It's, it's only readable. No longer, <laughs> no longer readable would be very bad, Joseph. <laughs> yes, yeah, that would be awful. Uh, so the use case for this is for um, secure enclaves. We actually use this with our, for Facebook, we have these things called pops, um, or uh, yeah, I think they're called, anyway. So there are special machines that we ship to ISPs, places we don't trust, right? We don't control the infrastructure, they just sit in an ISP. So like I've got like four sitting down the road for me in Raleigh. Um, so we need, to val we need to make sure that nobody can, t can mess with these things. And so, the thing will boot up and it has this encrypted seed device. And then from there, we add into it, because you can add devices to seed devices, you add a copy on write device to the seed device that's also encrypted. So any writes that happen go to this other device, but never to the actual seed device. So when you reboot, the, the, the scratch space is just deleted and the seed device is in this, in this same thing. Another use case we use this for, have, have used this for is with provisioning. 
uh, where you have like a raw image, that's your seed device, you bring it up, you add in the root device, you delete the seed device, which then copies the extra, the, the information to the right device, and then you can keep on going. So those are kind of like how we use seed. Cool. Uh, so I guess that's also like the fundamentals of how ButterFS convert works then, because that sounds very much like the same process for converting fi from one file system to ButterFS. Yeah, so convert is, a, is relatively similar. So what we do with convert is basically create a ButterFS file system and create extents that point at the old file system and just say, okay, those are special. Don't ever remove those. And then okay. when, when you do, and so when it does the convert, when you do the remove or whatever, it goes and removes the extents for the metadata and it leaves the data, the data in place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, just to kind of somehow slide back into the slide. Um, yep. ButterFS is developed by a wide variety of people long ago in the far past. Red Hat was also part of this, um, but today it is principally developed by folks at Facebook, SUSE, um, Western Digital, and Oracle. Um, and I think at this point, uh, it, it's sort of kind of obvious why you would want to use ButterFS, but to make it clear, like it's a great file system that's developed within the mainline kernel. It takes advantage of the facilities provided within the kernel to be more efficient at doing operations on devices. It's very straightforward to support in a, in a Linux distribution and provides a lot of advanced facilities that can be used to do all kinds of interesting um, user experience things with very minimal effort. Um, and today it's used in production by, as Joseph has mentioned, Facebook, it's also used in Synology, um, Thekus, Netgear, and Rockstor um, NAS devices, as well as being used in OpenSUSE and SUSE Linux Enterprise since 2014 as the default file system for operating system data, and since 2018 for all data um, in OpenSUSE. So, yeah. Um, Joseph, do you want to talk about the pr Facebook production stuff? Yeah. So. Uh... Facebook production has grown really organically. I, I like to, you know, I'm relatively conservative about ButterFS's usage. And I've, sorry, I don't know why that guy's on. Anyway, uh, the, the uh, there's, Facebook's a big company, right? And so a lot of engineers kind of run around trying and, and doing different things. Uh, and it kind of originally started with our build servers where we do this thing where, you know, every patch that's applied to the code base isn't actually applied until it, it builds and it passes all of its tests. The way we do that is, you know, we check out a, a copy of the, the, rep the repository, apply the patch, make sure it builds, run the tests. If it does land it and we delete the scratch space and this, uh, you know, it used to be run on XFS on like RAM disks. And it was real, real slow. You With uh, as many developers as we have, you'd end up with like queues of like two to three hours for every patch you tried to land, which kind of got unwieldy. Uh, so ButterFS was kind of evaluated originally to solve this problem for one of our worst uh, repos, which was the Android repo, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And um, and so was, we kind of, instead of doing like these shallow Git clones, the idea was like snapshot, like we only update the repo every 10 minutes. And we, instead of shallow cloning, we just snapshot the original, apply, build, test, remove. And so that whole process took like seconds to run compared to minutes, especially for the deletion. So the snapshot deletions appear to be instantaneous because we'll just like say, yeah, we'd finished. And then we do it in the background. So we're kind of cheating. Uh, <laughs> but that being said, it is significantly less heavyweight than RM minus RFing a shallow clone because you have to like remove links. And that's however many files you have is however many links that you need to remove. Whereas a snapshot delete is literally just on updating reference counts for any non-shared um, extents, which ends up being orders of magnitude smaller. Um, so it ended up being pretty fast. And then from there, people, we started to 
use it and like evaluate it for like our web tier and that sort of thing because we could use compression and um you know a, a variety of other neat tools and feature like the snapshotting stuff was really handy so we did that and then the container guys got a hold of it and have done all sorts of horrifying things with it um and it's kind of gotten to this point where um it's our entire production environment relies on it it's the only thing that works well so i keep saying this but it's not necessarily true it's the only thing we test um c group isolation with um, theoretically xfs will work now um, but at the time we were developing all this it didn't um, and ext4 just can't because of how it's designed uh, i say it can't. it probably could it just would be really hard um, and so because of all of these other extenuating circumstances it's become what we build everything on. And as it's become more ubiquitous in the fleet, people have found new and you know, horrifying ways to abuse it. <laughs> um, the container the container thing was really interesting because it first started out with like, eh, we're not sure if this is the right thing to do. So we'll just ship loopback devices with ButterFS file systems on it around everywhere. So we had like millions of machines with ext4, but like every box had you know 10 to 20 containers so they had like 10 to 20 loopback devices with butterfs on them um, so that was super awesome nowadays because we have butterfs's roots we can send send and receive images uh, which makes like has cut down on our bandwidth usage a lot for um, sending container updates and that sort of stuff um, and like i said because our entire production environment involves revolves around it the workloads uh, that are running on ButterFS are very um, dynamic. Um, you know, kind of one of the arguments early on was like ButterFS usage at Facebook is like not the same as how a user would use it, uh, which is, you know, relatively fair. Uh, but the way we use it is way worse than any user would ever use it. <laughs> And there's also the fact that we use it on all our dev VMs. So like these are developers, they're just writing code, building things, running tests, which is how a Fedora user is going to use their file system, right? And all of our dev VMs are all ButterFS file systems. All right. Uh, yeah, so some of the big wins, compression obviously was huge. Uh, we, uh, again, this is another thing we're like trying to, uh, you know, show that Facebook usage actually mirrors Fedora usage in a lot of ways. We buy probably the worst solid state drives you could possibly buy, you know, ones that you would find in consumer laptops, essentially. And uh, the compression was one of the things that really helped turn around the burn rates for these solid state drives. Uh, we were kind of burning through them pretty quickly. Um, the snapshots I've already mentioned really dramatically improved build and test times for our build systems and a variety of other things. Send and receive is based on snapshotting, right? And so that's really helped our container story and how we ship things and ship updates. Uh, one of the things more recently, um, Dennis Sow, one of the guys who worked for Facebook, he, uh, one of the things we noticed with uh, with these crappy solid state drives plus C group isolation is that discard uh, performance varies wi widely on uh, your solid state drives from, from drive to drive, from manufacturer to manufacturer. Uh, oftentimes solid state drives will go out, you know, stop responding for two to five seconds if they get the right discard <laughs> area. Um, so this is kind of a thing that we had to really think hard about. Um, and so async discard was a solution that we came up with, which was move discard outside of any hot path um, and uh, rate limit it because ext4, xfs, and butterfs did this thing where it's like, okay, we have all of the free space. Now we need to go through, discard all of the free space all at a time. And async discard says, okay, well, we're going to make sure it's only of a certain size and then we only do a certain amount over a given period of time in order to not affect the overall work workload. Um, this was kind of the last part of our C group isolation work where discards could drastically affect latencies if it went badly enough. And this kind of solved that for us. Uh, 
Uh, it's not always been awesome. Uh, not everything is great. <laughs> uh, we're, you know, we're still not awesome for databases, uh, kind of. Uh, so we still use a lot of MySQL stuff and a lot of it's moved on to MyRox, which is the RocksDB based backend for MySQL. And actually RocksDB works real well for ButterFS with its append only uh, write behavior. Uh, RocksDB is fantastic on ButterFS. The, the old fashioned NODB overwrite sort of thing does not work awesome for ButterFS. Uh, because of copy on writes, any overwrite sort of behavior is gonna end up with a lot of fragmentation and ends up uh, super, super sad. So again, this is why uh, vert images, I think Neil, this is in the later on, but we recommend uh, no data cow for, for vert images. And this is, this is actually twofold. Uh, no data cow means you can overwrite. So like you get nice big preallocated chunk and you just overwrite and you don't get the fragmentation. The other thing is, is um, the way ButterFS does checksumming, uh, you can't change the IO in flight, which we can do in the kernel. But things like vir um, virtual stuff or databases, they'd like to use odirect, which the user controls the memory. And there's no way that the kernel can keep the user from modifying data in flight. So you can often end up with checksum mismatches because like Windows, for example, doesn't um, maintain the page state as it's being written. So we calculate the checksum, we start to write it out somebody changes the data before it gets written out. So now there's different data that doesn't match the checksum. So this is the sort of trade-off that you have with ButterFS. Um, in addition to that, you know, checksumming and generally heavier metadata usage results in higher latencies for some workloads. You know, for you create a file in ext4, it goes and updates one bitmap and it like writes the inode out. Um, and it writes like one entry to a little tree to say this name belongs to this inode. For ButterFS, we have two entries for the name to map back to the original inode. Plus we have the inode reference to update to the inode so we can keep track of reference. This is how we can say like, hey, what what's the name of this file when you do scrub, for example. That's how we go and find out what the name of that file is, is with the references. And with all this like extra stuff, you some workloads notice this. Uh, ButterFS is fantastic at finding bad hardware. Um, unfortunately, we had a Fedora user find this out firsthand. Um, poor guy had bad memory um, and it's corrupted his file system. Uh, and notice because you get bad checksums. And if you get a bad checksum in the wrong place, you're gonna have a super bad time. Um, which again, kind of highlights the need, the continued need for backups, right? Um, ButterFS is really good at finding these problems. And, uh, you know, with ext4 or XFS, you can go on your merry way, ignorance of these issues. We actually had a pretty interesting issue early on in our ButterFS rollout where we had a RAID device that would write to the middle of the disk every time we read at the box. And this was corrupting AI training data. Um, and uh, XFS, you know, has no idea, right? So they've just been using this corrupted um, AI training data for years. And ButterFS started throwing checksum errors immediately. And of course, you know, it's 2014. And I'm like, nope, ButterFS is wrong. It's definitely, there's a bug somewhere. <laughs> no, it was this RAID device just writing to the middle of the disk every time it rebooted, which that was super cool. Um, uh, this, you know, and this isn't, it's been relatively s smooth sailing, but there are, it, there are millions of machines that myself and Omar Sandoval and Chris Mason are responsible for. So it's a, uh, it's a little stressful. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder if you can measure your Mountain Dew consumption in, in gallons at this point. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a. <laughs> A uh, trash can that's like desk height that's full of Mountain Dew bottles over there. That's from that's two weeks worth of consumption. Oh, it's, it's, it's oh. not good, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess this is where I kind of take over, talking a little bit about ButterFS and Fedora, like what what we're doing here and where we're going. So a little bit about the current state. 
Um, with Fedora 33, Anaconda's been configured to install the non-server variants with ButterFS. The disk images of the desktop variants have already been configured to be built with ButterFS. Um, we're still kind of waiting for, for the final validation for some of those because of um, issues that we discovered through trying to build the ARM images. We, uh, Joseph, myself, Davida, we've we've worked through them and like Davida and I've made patches um, across the stack for fixing them. Uh, so we're just kind of waiting and seeing to see if everything kind of worked. So crossing fingers, but we're basically ready to fix more of those as they as issues like that come up. Um, Libvirt now will set no data cow for VM disk images uh, that it creates. So this will apply to known boxes. This will, yay, thanks, Kevin. Kevin just told me in the chat that they are in fact in production. So we will find out with the nightly compose. Sweet. Uh, so yeah, so VMs through Libvirt are now going to, VMs created through Libvirt will have no data cow set automatically. This avoids the very painful double cow scenario that impacts performance. Uh, and will make it so that we can um, avoid most of the painful um, performance scenarios uh, that people would see by a default Fedora setup, since we do ship GNOME boxes on uh, Fedora Workstation, and a lot of people use Vert Manager and Libvirt. Um, we do not have compression enabled currently. And this is pending some discussion with the Anaconda developers and tweaks to the image build tools. Um, there's, um, Chris Murphy and I had been talking about this and there's some complexities related to the nature of how, um, how we actually produce images to make it so that we produce the ButterFS image with one way saying Z standard compression seven force all to make it so that it applies the compression uniformly across the board. Um, and then after the fact in the mount options, we just want it to do Z standard one so that on an ongoing basis, it's a cheap compression. Um, this is not figured out yet. I don't know how we're gonna do it. And that's part of the reason why that's not there right now. Um, boot is not ButterFS by default. This is also pending discussion with the bootloader team um, it is technically possible to do this right now. Anaconda will happily let you do it and it does work, but um, there's some, for turning it on by default, I'm not comfortable with that until I figure out more of some of the other related feature enablement that I've got planned for this. Um, and disk encryption currently will use Lux. Um, Lux with ButterFS means only full disk encryption is possible. Uh, that means that you can't do per sub volume uh, or because it's not a partition. It's the both home and root are on one volume, but you could only encrypt the whole volume. Um, now going forward to Fedora, uh, in the future, uh, so Fedora 34, Fedora 35 planning, um, I am very hopeful that we can get Z standard compression by default. Uh, that is something that I think will be extremely valuable and extremely useful in virtually every use case to have minimal Z standard compression just across the board. Um, boot on ButterFS by default is something I do want to change for the ButterFS default setup in, in sometime in the next year. Um, this is essentially going to be a prerequisite for supporting online or live full or partial disk encryption using ButterFS native encryption. Now, um, Joseph has mentioned in uh, before to us, uh, and uh, and I don't know if you want to do you want to speak a little bit about like the native encryption stuff. Um, but the core thing is that it will at least require moving boot to ButterFS because we need a way to do full disk encryption properly here. But um, do you want to talk about like the pending upstream work that's going on here? Yeah. Uh, so Omar Sandoval is working on the per subvolume encryption stuff for us. Uh, so it'll look essentially like what FScript looks like for ext4. Uh, it uses the same infrastructure and everything. Uh, the last thing we want to do is kind of roll our own encryption stuff that always ends in tiers and you know uh, security stuff. Uh, so the the way it'll work is it'll be per subvolume and you could probably you could, will be able to do it per file system but subvolume obviously is the, the bigger get, right? Um, and 
the uh, the main thing that he's working on right now is there's a lot of like features inside ButterFS that need to be reworked in order to support this, namely send and receive. Because um, again, for our use case, we want to be able to send and receive secure containers that like might have user data on it, right? And um, to do this, we need to like send and receive. For example, with compression, we'll like decompress and send the raw stuff, like the actual data over the wire. Um, and so that's not nice, but wasn't really a problem. But with encryption, that's a problem. Uh, we want to be able to send like the actual encrypted data as well as compressed extents and that sort of thing. So uh, there's there, he's working on that right now to be able to send and receive the like raw encrypted data on the send and receive side. And once that's in place, then it's just a matter of fixing that and fixing um, getting that into place and getting the repair stuff for like scrub and multi-disc stuff because we'll automatically rewrite other things in the background. Like if you have a RAID set up, like a mirrored set up and one disc is going bad and the other disc is fine, we'll like rewrite the second, the bad copy to another location on that disc uh, to repair it. And this again has to be a little bit sensitive with uh, encrypted data. Uh, so we're going to there's stuff like that and that needs to be figured out and he's getting that worked through right now. The idea is that end of end of the year, we have that at least going upstream and then cool. we'll be able to have per sublime encryption. Cool. Um, so yeah. Uh, and as I said earlier, that will require having boot on Butterfest. Um, the next thing that uh, that I'm hoping to have done within the next year, David and I had started strategizing about this, and we've got and he made the initial work done for this. Um, but support for Butterfest for the OS build image build tool. So the initial work is already done um, during the cycle. It can produce a file system, uh, a Butterfest file system, but it doesn't have a mechanic for creating sub volumes and setting up those flags and stuff that we need. Um, for a lot of what I'm, what I've been talking about here, and so that's something that we need to kind of go back and figure out how to implement. And the reason why I put OS build in here is that um, we've been there. There's been some discussions um, in, about using OS build more for building images to replace some of the um, litany of tools. Is the nicest way I could put it for building images in Fedora. I think at my last count there was like five. Which is wait, which is like four too many. Um, it was very, very hard figuring out everything I needed to fix. Um, so that is something that uh, we'd like to make sure. If everything is in fact going to move towards OS build, we want to make sure that Butterfest is a first class citizen there. And so we're gonna we're moving towards we're working towards that. Um, and the last bit that I've been working towards and thinking about is a simpler setup for full system snapshotting and boot to snapshot. This is pending some coordination with the bootloader team and snapper developers. And the reason why I'm talking about this particularly as a separate point is because Red Hat and SUSE have very different philosophies on how this is going to work in their platforms. Um, Red Hat has been moving more towards this, um, this strategy of using uh, um, configuration file snippets with the bootloader spec in the non-standardized, very super extended version of bootloader spec, but using configuration snippets instead of um, having Grub do auto discovery. So the SUSE style has been, um, if you structure the file system correctly, um, Grub can actually just figure out all of your snapshots, populate the menus and set it up and you're good to go. Um, Red Hat is going for the more um, concrete, I guess, in my opinion, probably struck a strictly defined model of how to do this. And, and we just simply don't have any infrastructure in place to do it that way just yet. Um, we actually do support the SUSE style way today, but I didn't want to kind of go towards that for defaults in Fedora when the bootloader team and everyone else is really moving towards this bootloader spec thing. So this is more of a, I have to go back to the drawing board and figure out how we want to implement this. To, to do this properly. And I wanna make this something that we can expose to the desktop level um, for tools and other things to use and take advantage of. And I don't really know when that's gonna happen, but that's certainly, it's, it's, on, it's in, my, uh, in my roadmap for this thing. Um, and let's see, before I move on to the next section, is there any other 
Yes, Matthew Miller. People need to stop making new tools for building images. We're now at, I think I last counted, we're at seven. We're at seven image building tools in Fedora and they're all in use somewhere. Uh, and that really hurts a lot. Um, so yeah. Uh, now I think I'm gonna hand this off to Dusty who will show us the coolness that is ButterFS with system snapshots. Um, oh yeah, Kevin, yes. There is discussion at HomeD and ButterFS integration. Actually, Leonard was one of the first to suggest that we use ButterFS with HomeD. So this will this will definitely um, be a part of the overall strategy as we look towards towards this. But like, I'll let me hand this off to Dusty so he can show us cool stuff. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I actually have a, a slide in there, Neil. If you yeah, let me move on to it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I am going to demo today kind of my custom mm -hmm. setup that I've been using for years. Uh, I, a little bit of history here. I used to work for a telecom company, um, and one of our big features was being able to upgrade and roll back. At the time, uh, very long time ago, we were using RPM repackaged packages. If you happen to know what those ever were, oh no! Uh, and uh, to, in order to do rollbacks, um, but part of my job when I was there was to actually advance our state of the art and not use RPM repackaged packages anymore because that, that can be bad, uh, <laughs> into something a little more reliable. So we started moving over to uh, LVM uh, logical volume snapshots with thin, thin pools. Uh, and then when I came to Red Hat, uh, you know, I kind of was monitoring ButterFS a little bit. And then also this RPM OS tree thing was just getting a start. Uh, so just, Everything in this space has always kind of interested me. So anything that's like, oh, let me upgrade my system and also go back to a previous point in time, I've kind of dabbled in a little bit. So this is just an example of me, you know, playing around with the tools that exist and, and seeing what's possible. So my setup, uh, at least what I'll show you today, is a simple system with a single file system, uh, you know, a root file system. Uh, I probably shouldn't have said slash root, should have just been slash, but um, it's just a root file system. In this case, I do have a Lux set up on here because that when the last time I tested it, it just happened to be how it worked. So I'll go ahead and apologize for having to wait uh, for Grub to decrypt the device in order to get into it. I'll make uh, Neil uh, answer a question or tell a joke or give a fun fact during that 10 seconds it takes every time. Um, <laughs> So uh, the sure. way I have things set up is uh, we have ButterFS snapshots set up to be taken each time uh, DNF does a package update. And uh, what we'll do today is demonstrate rolling back to a previously taken snapshot. Um, all of this is kind of documented in a, a series of blog posts that I do periodically that says how I set this up for this version of Fedora. The last time I did it was for, for Fedora 31. I usually skip um, releases just because uh, I wish I had ample time to go through and do this every time, but I usually wait until one EOLs and then I do it. Uh, the caveat for my current setup is it does lump uh, boot into the root file system. So uh, we I don't handle UAFI. I basically wanted to be able to snapshot everything. And, um, you know, since UAFI requires fat, I just... It's just not something I really wanted to get into. And the other caveat is uh, the state of the art might be better today. I mean, I, I implemented this a long time ago and it just happens. I tweak it every once in a while, but I haven't spent a lot of time going back in and trying to, you know, reinvestigate how things are. So taking all that into consideration, let's see if I can share my screen. Yay. Okay. So everybody can see my screen and the cons or the font is big enough. Should I do anything different? Looks okay. Yep. Looks good. Okay. All right. So what I've got here is a system that's set up. I've got the serial console up here and I've got SSH down here. Um, basically what I have is a single uh, disk in my system, a partition, Lux on top of that. And then um, I actually do have LVM. Don't ask me why. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, but 
<laughs> the important thing to know is that it's ButterFS on top of that uh, that root file system that's on the root um, LV. So let me go through and actually show. Uh, so this is the root logical volume is five gigabytes, and if I um, show there's an actual ButterFS file system there. If I do uh, block ID on that, it should show ButterFS. Um, so that's all you really need to know at this point. Um, so this system literally I just installed. So it's been up 37 minutes since after the beginning of this talk. Um, and you know it's brand new, fresh. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to uh, enable um, quota on the file system. I don't know if this is still needed or not. I just know it used to be. And this kind of allows us to keep track of how much uses, usage is in each snapshot. Um, so that's just a preparatory step. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install Snapper and a Python or a DNF plugin that basically will hook into Snapper every time we do a transaction. Um, so this basically will add the glue that allows DNF to trigger a snapshot to happen. Okay, so that's installed. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to tell Snapper, oh my gosh, I just almost called it the wrong thing, uh, <laughs> to create a, create a configuration for the root file system, or yeah, for the root snapshot. Um, and then uh, what we can see now is we have a dot snapshots uh, sub volume. Um, and Varlib Portables is in there just because systemd creates it by default, so you can ignore that for now. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set it up so that that dot snapshots uh, actually gets mounted on boot. Um, I typically do that just so I can go back and look at, you know, what snapshots exist and, you know, diff files if I need to. This actually what became a problem for me recently because uh, an SE Linux update caused a, you know, relabel of all the files in the file system that it could find. And so for my 80 some snapshots over the past eight months or so, it decided to go through each one of them and try to do that, which was not good. Um, yeah, that was that was not good anyway. So what I can do now is I can look at the default sub volume for uh, for root and it is um, the one with ID five. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new snapshot and call it Big Bang. So this is just like represents the, uh, the first point in time at which, you know, there's a snapshot that exists for this system. So we can see basically we have the thing that I'm currently booted into and then also the first snapshot that I created with the description Big Bang. And you can see, um, you know, kind of the amount of space that's exclusive to that snapshot. Um, okay, and the next thing I'm going to do, since I just created a, a snapshot, I'm going to go up here in the serial console and run something that's going to take just a little bit of time. So now that I've got a snapshot, let me do something to change the system. So I'm going to update the kernel. So if I look right now, my kernel is very old because this is installed from the Fedora 31 uh, server DVD, yeah. So this oh is 5.3.7. Uh, so I'm getting a much newer kernel up there at the top. Uh, but while we wait on that kernel to get installed, uh, let's actually go through and look at the subvolume list that was created as a result of us creating this Big Bang snapshot. Um, so you can see that snapshots one snapshot now exists, and there's actually a snapshots two snapshot. Uh, that is because uh, the start of that RPM transaction up there actually created a third, or I don't know, ID number two snapshot. Um, and so at the beginning of the RPM transaction, it'll create a snapshot. And also at the end of the RPM transaction, it'll create a snapshot, which is kind of cool. So we're waiting for that to install. Uh, once that gets done installing, I will reboot the system and we will see First of all, we'll wait a really long time for Grub to decrypt my uh, my Lux device. And during that amount of time, I'm gonna make Neil tell us something funny or 
interesting. Sure. I mean, uh, while Dusty's computer goes through a basically decryption hell, um, uh, one of the things that differs from Dusty's setup and mine actually is, well, uh, ignoring the fact that he's got LUX and LVM underneath, <laughs> um, I actually have ButterFS split out as a subvolume rather than having it just integrate in the main file system. And the main reason I have it that way, uh, I, I do it because I want to be able to not have boot snapshot in the same cadence as the operating system. And this is mostly because of quirks with configuring um, the bootloader. You don't want the bootloader configuration to get rolled back with the rest of the system sometimes. And I like the flexibility of it, that not happening when I don't want it to happen. And also, in my case, I have Grub set up to auto discover the snapshots and populate the menu. Whereas, um, I don't know, Dusty, is your setup to auto populate or no? Uh, the Grub menu? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so the, I think those were extra patches that I needed to pull in. Okay. Um, so I don't have the option to select different snapshots in Grub right, uh, right now. Yeah, okay. I don't have that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have that by virtue of my weird setup, which is nice, but is I don't think will fly in Fedora anytime soon. So, um, I yeah. So, so now I've got the are. system back up. I've got the hey. system back up. And we can see we've got two different kernels. Um, and you can also see that the newer one is the one that's booted right now. Uh, so we essentially have an updated system, but we also have uh, those snapshots that exist that were taken, you know, pre and post uh, the, the, the package update. So what we're going to do now is um, actually, I'm going to go all the way back to the original snapshot that I took, which was the very first one, the Big Bang. Um, so I'm going to roll back to one, and it tells you what it's doing. So it's creating a read-only snapshot of the, of the current system. So it created a brand new snapshot, snapshot four. And it's going to create a read-write snapshot of snapshot one. So, And that's what we're going to boot into as a result. So it actually doesn't affect snapshot one. It just says, oh, make a copy of snapshot one and set that as the target. So if we look at um, you know, what snapshots exist right now, we can see five is there, and that's what we're actually going to boot into next time. It's also so, important to note that snapshot five takes up virtually no space. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it's funny because like as you go on, you can start to see uh, things like the exclusive space that's used for each one start to increase. Um, so if you start to run out of, um, let me type this. If you start to run out of space for whatever reason, you can go back in and like choose which snapshot is a good candidate to get rid of based on you know how how large it is and stuff like that. Neil, any more fun facts for us? Ah, uh, sure. Um, well. Uh... No, I don't. I, what about you, Joseph? I don't have anything. <laughs> I got nothing, man. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I apologize for having to wait uh, for this to decrypt every time. I'm guessing guess that Grub, Grub's Lux code is like, bad. I don't know. It doesn't take, you know, it's probably just all pure software implementation or something. I don't know. It takes a while. But, uh, and I also apologize for not setting this up in a different way. I did try to do that right before this talk and it didn't work and I got scared. So I like, was like, no, just go back to exactly what I know works. Um, <laughs> so yeah, at least we have a demo. So, all right, so we should be nope. back up. Peter, Peter just answered, it has no way to use hardware acceleration or threading. Oh, so yeah. it's <laughs> threaded and super slow. Yes, it definitely is. But hey, it, it works. Has support, it's kind of neat. Um, I mean, yeah. Okay, so now we are back into the system at the point in time that I basically created that first Big Bang snapshot. Um, so if I run rpm-q kernel, 
I only see one kernel that exists. If I look in the boot uh, directory, I don't see the new kernel that we installed. I don't see any of that. Um, so this is just an example of you made a change to your system. Maybe it didn't work for whatever reason, and you can go completely back to the old, uh, you know, the state of the system at which you uh, you took a snapshot in the past. You know, this isn't going to solve a problem with regards to your data, right? Um, so, like, if you want, if you don't want to take your data back to that point in the past, then you'll you'll need to have another sub volume or something like that where your data is. Um, so, pretty much everything goes back. And then, you know, everything is under the snapshots directory. And we can actually look in snapshots, was it three or four? Um, and if we look under there, you can see, oh, that is where we had actually updated uh, the, and the new kernel was exist, existed on the file system, right? So this is just a quick and dirty example of what you can do with uh, ButterFS snapshots. It interested me because rolling back was always fun. Yeah, uh, I mean, just you know, small point to add to this, like this concept doesn't have to be applied to a full system. As Joseph mentioned earlier, like Facebook is using this with containers and this is actually most of what I use this for. I mean, I do have the full system snapshot set up one of the reasons why Dusty setup is now more, much more simple in his blog posts because I helped make it in the Grub normally, but because uh, I used to have to patch my Grub for this, and that was not fun. Um, but too, I think I had a copper or something where I had a patched Grub. Yeah, that that was not fun. Um, but you know, you can do this with containers, and I actually do this quite a lot to manage different operating system environments where I need to do fairly destructive things inside of the environment and roll it back. And so that's very handy. And systemd and spawn has integrated support for this. Um, so with that, uh, I we have just the questions and resources. So I know we're technically over time, but if anyone's got questions, I think we're happy to answer a few. Uh, is it possible to boot from USB DVD, mount the ButterFS file system, true it, and do the rollback? Yes, that is totally possible. As long as your as long as your operating system environment actually supports mounting the ButterFS file system, you can do anything. And I've actually I've actually um, rescued one of my laptops which had a faulty um, SATA SSD, which is how I found out I shouldn't buy certain brands. SSDs anymore. Um, I've actually rescued one of them uh, by using Fedora Live Media, mounting it up, and roll it back. Um, David's asking, uh, "Do we are we going to have a blueprint for ButterFS-based images? I assume you're talking about with OS build. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to work with anyone who's interested in that to like start making some examples of how to produce Fedora-based images using ButterFS. Like I, I, this is something that I, I am personally very excited about. So I'd love to, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to help them with that. And I'm sure um, Davida and I can like help with making that sort of become a thing. Um, Jerry asks, any progress on booting ButterFS read only failed system? Ah, Joseph, I think this is actually more in your wheelhouse. Well, I, you know, it's kind of a bunch of us, right? So it's, uh, if things go wrong right now with any file system, uh, the you get dumped at an emergency prompt, which is not awesome. Uh, not really a problem for XFS and the XD4 because generally you can limp along and you won't notice problems. ButterFS, you will. Uh, so the kind of the thing, the idea is to change this, and this is more of a system-wide change. Like this involves system D work and maybe some GNOME work, that sort of stuff. To say like, okay, I couldn't mount the file system because of this. Try some of the fallback operations um, in order to get like a, a read-only environment so we can boot it up and at least try to fix things. And so I'm doing work on the ButterFS side to not only just make us more resilient to really bad failures in general, but also allow us to limp along in better cases. And then there's work that needs to be done on the system D side to handle a file system that's read-only and then provide the ability to mount with these different options if things go wrong. 
So there's a question about supporting defragmentation of the file system without undoing deduplication. My understanding is that we already do this basically for free with the yeah. way that yeah. with the way that works. So the, the defrag stuff is not snapshot aware because uh, that was originally implemented like ohm to the box. <laughs> oh, uh, and so right. it was one of those things where like I found it and was like, oh God, that's fucking terrible. And I turned it off because I couldn't, I couldn't fix it at the time. And then it just has not gotten fixed since then. Uh, it's something that we can address eventually. It's not that hard to do. It's just somebody needs to sit down and do it. And, um, you know, my to-do list keeps getting longer and longer and preempted and preempted. So there are plans to do it. It just, it doesn't right now. It kind of sucks. Yeah. I know that feeling. <laughs> so, uh, anything else from anybody or are we done here? Uh, looks like we're done here. So thank you all for coming to our talk about ButterFS on Fedora. I hope you'll have a great time uh, with Fedora 33 with ButterFS by default. And let us know how you think about it. Oh, and forgot to mention, um, there will be upcoming test days and all kinds of fun stuff like that. And I'm crossing my fingers that we can get a, a badge for testing ButterFS and Fedora during this cycle. And so if we can get that squared away, then you know if you help us test during you know test days and beta and stuff like that, you could get a badge for you know helping us make ButterFS even more buttery. So yeah, thank y'all. Uh, thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks everybody.